Welcome to Homeboys Down Under. Uh, we're back down in the Southern Hemisphere, hoping to take your calls about various things and our friends down under hopefully will call in and give us a take on things like the Barcelona game and we'll look forward to the Kilmarnock game and we'll talk a few, a few other issues and give a few other things uh, a wee punt. Um, before we go on, I should uh, tell you that to my left is my glamorous assistant, Mr Josh Gaffney. Josh, are you there? Hello. What an introduction that was, Josh. You still sleeping? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Uh, early in the morning. Oh, you are still sleeping then? Yeah, a little bit. Cool, cool. So this is a new thing that we're trying. Uh, the Reverend David Harper has finally gone back to his flock and uh, can't do these shows. So he's brought in the, the, the reserve team of me and Josh to uh, try and get this thing going. And... Um, we're basically looking for, for calls. Anybody want to call in, particularly our friends in the Summer Hemisphere? Um, if you want to call in, you just simply uh, go on to Skype, add Homeboys, we'll add you, and then you can call in and give us your thoughts, views, and opinions. So, Josh, uh, we'll get things moving along here. Uh, what did you, what was your take on the Barcelona game? I thought it was an absolutely fantastic performance from the team. Uh, going ahead uh, in the first half was definitely over my expectations uh, I was just a little bit disappointed that we didn't hold on for just one more minute mm. Yeah it seemed to be that, um, that we got three body blows in the game and the first was obviously uh, Samaras going off then we had a goal at half time we couldn't recover and a goal at full time we didn't recover but um, if we get, get back to the start yeah, what did you make of the actual team selection were you happy with it? Yeah, I was quite happy with the team selection. Um, I know a few people are kind of calling for like Chris Commons mm -hmm. and and a few more attacking players to be playing, but you know I kind of knew that we're going to kind of have to resort to a kind of four five one and only have one man up front, and then mainly have kind of play a kind of defensive tactic, and it worked for most of the game. You know, playing that kind of tactic. Uh, and then, even though we brought on Chris Commons and James Forrest, the more attacking players, we actually started to get a little bit less of the ball because mm. they weren't really breaking out any more effective than Scott Brown and Samaras. Uh, so I was happy with the starting lineup. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, uh, the game plan, you know, it, it almost came off. Um, I've seen some rubbish out there about um, possession statistics and all that, but our game plan was to clearly hold them at the 18 yard line as much as we could, and then when we could break, we did break, you know. And any Esther himself said that uh, he had uh, never seen a team attacking so much numbers as Celtic did, and that was clearly the plan. So if anybody out there is a bit possession police, you know, just think about that. You know, I know that the, uh, our friends uh, across the city of Glasgow are kind of obsessed with tendencies in possession right now, and we're, we're kind of concentrating on Champions League football. So um, I think that uh, you know defensively we were excellent. I thought Lustig, you know, he switched off a couple of times early, but he sorted that out. Uh, Kelvin Wilson, great. 
Yeah, uh, is is starting to come back to himself again? Thank God. And Effie Ambrose was just absolutely outstanding. I mean, this is a guy who come in and said straight away, "I've played against Messi. I know how to play against him. Don't worry about it." And I think we all gave a collective gasp when he said that. But it ended up being uh, Messi's first game in 2012 that he didn't actually score in or get an assist in. So, you know, I thought um, Ambrose in particular was absolutely outstanding. Um, what about the midfield, Josh? What do you think about that? I still don't really know. I mean, we did have 20, 27% of the possession and, you know, that is quite decent for actually being at new camp and we did create four chances uh, mm. well, four opportunities uh, better sides have gone there and created less opportunities uh, AC Milan in one game drew 0-0 with Barcelona but they actually only created one chance um, but the midfield I think we could have maybe held on to the ball a little bit more uh, even though they're defensively doing very well but yeah again playing against Barcelona uh they're great attacking and defensive side. Yeah, I think Neil Lennon made that point before the game where he said that uh, you know Barcelona have made great teams look ordinary in the new camp and and in their own ground it has to be said. And um, I think you know my, my take on these kind of games is always the same. You know when you're playing such a quality opposition is first of all you you, you don't want to concede early. I mean that is you know the thing that you're dreading more than anything. You didn't want to go in and suddenly be a goal down before you even broke sweat secondly I think then once you you get over that hurdle you then you sort of refine your shape and make sure that's the shape that you've been trying to get and people have settled into it and then thirdly um, you try and score a goal and I think that's what we've done and uh, I must admit it was again it's the, it's the one tinge of regret it's the fact that Sam and I went off um, because I think Josh um, as you've seen for the goal he scored he had to beat any the, the Barcelona defence yeah, um, and when you look at Mascherano later in the game, and he got a yellow card against James Forrest. It, mm. uh, the Barcelona defence could have really struggled in this game if Sam Ass had stayed on. Um, and by him going off, we didn't really have much of an out ball. Uh, and I think that's maybe why we lost, because you know if we had a bit more of an out ball, then mm. perhaps in the last few minutes of the game, we could have held the ball up front a bit more. Yeah, I mean, it was clear that uh, Gary Hooper was struggling, <coughs> excuse me, uh, up front on his own. Uh, it's no his game. Um, you know, he wants to hold the ball around the 18 yard box and stuff like that, and then run off, peel off defenders, things like that. Different ball game when it's 35, 40 yards for your goal. It's much harder to penetrate a defence for there. And you could tell by, you know, 20 minutes to go, he was absolutely knackered and he was making a few wrong decisions where he was turning into defenders rather than taking any corner flags and stuff like that and allowing the team to get up the park. But um, what about in terms of, um, how can I put it, uh, the midfield? Do you think with the midfield that um, they were kind of restricted in how much they could attack? Yeah. Definitely a lot, but because I mean, Xavi is probably the best central midfielder on earth, and you know he he ran his heart out uh, on Tuesday night as well. Uh, he did something like eleven kilometers. Um, mm -hmm. We certainly tried, um, and it was it was working when Scott Brown was on, because mm -hmm. uh, you know like he was he was having another one of their really good games. He was organising the defence. You could see him pointing. Uh, Lustig uh, to follow his man um, and when he was attacking he was doing some smart moves uh, to keep on uh, to keep possession so when we lost him I think we kind of actually lost a lot of our attacking through it along with losing Samaras mm -hmm. uh, the certain midfielders I actually thought Victor Wanyama looked a little bit outpaced at times right. um, he didn't have a bad game but sometimes you know he, he went to try to get his man but uh, the man managed to kind of get away from him to avoid the tackle. Uh, but I thought Victor Wanyama got better as the game went on. Mm. Uh, Joe Ledley, uh, he was on a, uh, he, he was on the f defensive f frame of mind as well. Uh, he put in a few, a few good tackles, but he didn't really do that much with attacking. Um, I, I don't think we could have really asked for the midfield to do much more, actually. Yeah. 
Uh, you're listening to Homeboys Down Under. If you want to come in, call in, uh, disagree with us, talk to us, whatever you want to do, just uh, Skype in, uh, add Homeboys, and we'll add you in. No, I think, I mean, you know, there's, you know, you could kind of look at small wee um, things, but I don't think we could have done much more. Um, you're playing against the top side in the world. They need to win the game. They want to win the game. There was no resting players. There were actually resting players for this game. So um, I think it's quite incredible the um, progression that um, Seattle have actually made in this in this sense because um, tactically we are getting better. I mean, there's no doubt about that. I think Neil Lennon's really um, really doing his homework on these teams and he's really learning as a manager. And it pleased me that we didn't just go to the new camp and kind of park the bus and just hope for the best, which many, many teams far better than us have, um, have tried to do in the past. And um, I think that's a credit to, to the management and the players. I mean, um, in terms of the players, one of the things I was thinking about, Josh, is the fact that we didn't seem to be really reliant on one player anymore like in the past we might have been. Um, do you see do you see a more a kind of team ethic coming through in this team? Yeah, definitely. The average uh, average age in the squad is very low. There's quite a lot of players with, with a lot of promise, and there's uh, there's players performing in every position, and they've also got backup for almost every position. We've got two good right backs. We've got two good left backs. We've got centre. Uh, we've got several good centre backs. Um, we've got an abundance of centre midfielders. We've got Kaya, Ledley, Victor Wanyama, Scott Brown, uh, Torzik. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I probably missed out one. Uh, the, the only position I really feel that we're kind of a little bit weak on is in the winger positions because we've only really got Samaras, Collins, and Forrest. But we're definitely not weak there. We're just, that's just our. Uh, so what's the name for it? the weakest link? <laughs> the weakest side. link. The weakest link is in a strong side. Yeah, I mean, I mean, what do you think of Forrest in, in this season? How do you, how have you viewed him so far? It's a little bit of a mixed one. Uh, it hasn't actually looked that good. He's, he's had his pace. He's been good in some games. Uh, I thought he was good against Real Tovers. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was good against. He was good when he came on against Spartak Moscow. But some games, he's just not really been that effective on the pitch. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's unfortunate as a young player, he's been hampered by a few injuries and they can really take their toll on young players, perhaps, if they're not kind of fully developed physically and stuff like that. But um, I, I just think the only thing wrong with Forrest at the minute is perhaps his decision-making. You know, he's kind of hesitating now and again. And, you know, it's, I think I'm a firm believer in football being a kind of instinctive game. I think that's why Commons has come back to his best. And he's, he's playing on instinct again. He's shooting through wherever he feels like uh, he's making good passes. He's, you know, he's trusting his ability. And that's the kind of way. I mean, I think a perfect example of that was, was Tony Watt um, on Saturday at St. Mirren. Were you surprised that Tony Watt was now on the bench on uh, Tuesday? Yeah, I was a little bit surprised that he got the nod. Uh, what well, well, that? Like Miku got the nod before him uh, because it, it was very good against St. Martin and he can play in these sort of wide positions as well uh, or play as a striker. And I think when Gary Hooper started to get tired, I think Tony Watt's pace could have actually threatened Barcelona. Uh, but it is a big ask for uh, an 18 or 19 year old to play against the best team in the world. Uh, we've got Collar in. Uh, Stephen Monaghan. How you doing, guys? All right? You hear me okay? Hello? Uh, I don't know what's happened to... Oh, to sex. All right, Rick. Hello? Hello, what happened? Uh, oh, had a little bit of an issue oh, there. Yeah. Uh, Skype somehow put me in an hour call. Uh, when I was trying to accept the call and uh, this conference. Well, come on, Josh. You're the technical brains of this side, and you've already messed it up. Come on, let's go. What's happening? Who's calling in? Uh, Stephen Monaghan. Well, Adam, at the call then. Right, I'll try. Right, that's him in now. Stephen, are you there? 
How you doing, Paul? All right, mate? Thank God we had good boy there. Just had a, a come on here. So we need you to come in and save us. So how are you doing, Paul? What about you? Get straight in here. Um, can you give us your thoughts and reflections on Tuesday? I certainly mean, I, I think, obviously, um, we've got to look at the bigger picture of the, the way I've, I've portrayed it, Paul. I think there's been a lot of, obviously, other events happening in British football recently. Um, I, I think the the um, performances of the English Premier League teams, which is absolutely appalling, absolutely adds to Celtic's performance the other night. I know um, I tweeted about it the other night for the guys down under, they probably wouldn't have seen the feed. Um, I started following the French journalist on Twitter, I can't even remember the guy's name, who was appeared with um, Gordon Strachan on ITV on Tuesday night, if you've seen him. Oh, I think, is that the guy, Philippe O'Clair? That, that's your man, Paul. Aye. Well, um, and the, the biggest thing I got for him, obviously Strachan was exceptional as ever, talking is up. Mm -hmm. But the thing I think O'Clair um, highlighted was the fact that now that Victor Winyama, although I mean, the, the whole team performance was fantastic, but... The fact that when Yama's stock now was in Europe, it wasn't just the English Premier League teams that were looking at him. Um, the game mean Fraser Foster compared to Joe Hart. So I think in, in that performance, you know, and they, they never got a break. Um, no, I thought the team were exceptional. I, I mean, I, I just picked up on what Josh said as well. I mean, we're, we're looking at um, Samar asking off, which was our main factor in how we were playing that night because we were terrifying him any time we were getting the ball to him. I thought Chris Commons was very good when he came on as well doing his stuff. But no, I mean, it was, it was an all round um, it was It was a great performance. I mean, Scott Brown as well. But I mean, I, I never really picked up on that. I must have been grabbing a coffee. But supposedly they, they walloped Scott Brown right away, right in the ribs, one of my mates said. Aye, I noticed that myself. And you touched on uh, Victor Wanyama there. We've got the news this week that the, the agencies will only be signing a new contract. I mean, he's contracted to Celtic to 2015. And. Um, you know, the club kind of let it slip through a few so uh, leaks that um, we turned down an £8.5 million pound bid for QPR. Now, of course, we're three years away from 2015, and it might just be a wee bit back and back and forward in the business sense. But, I mean, what kind of value are you thinking for Vic Victor Wanyama these days? Um, I, I, I think, I mean, I, I read you, I also seen that thing also you said about QPR. I think mm. the most important aspect of the Victor Wanyama deal is is that there's got to be a very, very... I, I would take a downsize in the initial payment if we got a bigger sell-on fee on them. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a good point. Of it. Uh, um, because I think, it mean, if, if he's got a good agent, I mean, we're, not, we're, we're talking now, we, you're looking at the product, you're looking at a team like AC Milan in Europe who are struggling at the moment. It can basically, I mean, I, I think I said the homeboys or whatever it was a few weeks ago, Victor Wanyama defines now what a top European footballer is, midfield-wise. He's yep. sighted, bold, stature, technical ability. I mean, we've seen him at Inter Milan, Paul. They couldn't mm -hmm. get him off the ball. To me, I mean, I've noticed in the last few weeks it might be a daft parrot, but, but to me, in European football, whereas the rest of the Celtic team, maybe Ambrose apart, were very fast and hustled in the ball. It's... Mm -hmm. He starts to slow down a little bit when Yama gets on the ball. He's comfortable enough to say, right, I'm putting my foot in the ball. What am I going to do with it? And he's, if he decides to run, very few is going to put him off the ball. Yeah, we've just let's just say we've been joined by Pat Close from Melbourne. Pat, are you there? I am, boys. Yeah, great. How are you doing, How are you? How are you doing? Uh, Just talking about Victor Wanyama's performance on Wednesday, uh, it's on Tuesday, Pat, um, in the terms of his grown stature and value. What, what, what was your thoughts? Well, it was Wednesday for us, <laughs> bright and early on yeah. Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> Very early in the morning for us. Um, yeah, like I, I probably I guess what most people thought he, he, I think I thought he started off a bit slow and maybe nerves. I don't know what it was, but um, I think as a, the game went on, I think he got better. Um, obviously pushed forward a, a few times, but um, I think it was kind of like a like the rabbits in the, the the headlights when he when he got, got anywhere near the box. Didn't know what to do with it when he was uh, mm -hmm. sort of pushing forward, but. Um, yeah, like, I mean, like he's. I said, I think at the start of it, he was, and it wasn't just him. There was a few guys. I think obviously a bit nervous on the on the big stage and stuff. Yeah. Um, the goal certainly definitely definitely made a lot of players kind of settle down a little bit. Um, but then I think yeah, I don't know, just um, Barcelona just twisted the knife a little bit, bit by bit. Yeah. Because um, there was something I don't know if anyone noticed. There was a whole midfield when Yama right across. They were right at the start of the game. They were they were sort of um, defending really high up the park. Mm -hmm. But it was just bit by bit. It went further back. It was, and then I don't know if that was like a, 
a, a tactical thing they did, but it, it seemed to be because they were definitely very much in a straight line in, in certain sort of phases of the, the first half. And then, yeah, just bit by bit, Barcelona peg you back and peg you back. And before you know it, you're on, <laughs> you're on your 18 yard line. Well, let's take us right back to the start, and, and Stephen and Josh, feel free to jump in. But, uh, Pat, what time? So, what was your kind of schedule for Wednesday for watching the game? What time did it start? You know, where did you watch it? Uh, it was quarter to six here. Um, I know the Curl Supporters Club, um, so I'm in a Jockstein Sports Club in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, there's just that time in the morning, it's pubs went open. You know what I mean? It's just, we, we're, we're not based in a pub that's an all night sort of thing. And, so it's pretty hard for us. I know the guys certainly tried it and, and did a few phone calls around. And um, I don't know if it was that much of an interest. It was on it was on what they call free to air, so terrestrial TV over here. So it wasn't like on cable. So not everyone has cable. I don't have it. I, I get Celtic TV instead. But um, so a lot of people would be kind of put off. They can just you know get up in the morning, watch the game, and go to work, which is yeah. pretty much what everyone did. So it was unfortunate that way. Like you know you kind of want to be with your mates, but at the same time these guys run a business. You, you can't. You can't even ask me to open the pub mm. for, for 10 guys who are, probably wouldn't be drinking anyway. A few of them would be, but most guys would just be going to work after it. So, you know, be in your you know, sort of work clothes, your, your glad rags, your, your suit and tie and stuff. So, um, But yeah, well, like, like SBS is what I watched on. I know I um, listened to the Rebel podcast guys. They listened to it. I watched it on ESPN, I think it was, which I yeah. think is pretty much the same commentary. I think it's just the bits in between. You know the halftime sort of slots. I, I don't actually know. I don't. So I don't have uh, Fox Tell anymore. But yeah. it's David Proven and Ian Crocker. I think it was. Yeah, Ian Crocker from memory. Yeah, that's who. That's who we had up here as well. I. So I yeah, I think it's the same everywhere. When I watched it online, uh, the Spartak game. I think it's just pretty much the same. I think it's obviously something that UEFA do, that they just they farm out this, the exact same commentary, whether it's English, Spanish, whatever. They'll they'll just farm out the same one to each country or to mm. each each TV yeah. station. Did you want to say something there, Stephen? I was just I was just going to say it's I think it's it's unbelievable that Pat can watch the a Scottish football game on Terrestrial TV and we can't. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that, eh? Uh, actually that's I mean I'm not sure how aware of you that you are, Pat, but um we uh in Scotland on our terrestrial TV had Man United versus Braga. Um so you kinda of think Scottish champions, you know, got to the new camp, biggest game in the world. Why can we not see it on our normal telly? So, kind of bizarre. And I know STV have got a lot of criticism for that and they've kind of batted it back saying they can only see it to ITV and so on and so forth. But you've got to think they missed out a huge opportunity both for both audience figures and advertising revenue. Well, it is kind of ironic that, I mean, I think the thing I was tweeting, um, I think the day before the game, is that the whole world was going to be watching. Mm-hmm. So, it's on in the US, it's on in Australia, I presume it's on New Zealand, all these sort of places as well. But, it's kind of ironic that the place with the biggest the biggest market for it is uh, I'm not showing it, but more for <laughs> them. I mean, I, I left Scotland what, in '98. So that was kind of just when we sort of you know stopped attending the row and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I remember like STV showing and showing Rangers games on, in Champions League and um, well, I guess be man U at that stage in, in in England as well. So it's not as if they can't do it. Obviously, they can split it up whatever way they want, whatever way they choose. Mm-hmm. So I don't I don't see why they would have to show the same thing, you know. Right across the yeah, I mean it kind of ups. I don't know what Stephen and Josh think about it, so I'll pass it over to them after this. But the, it kind of ups me when the the companies in Scotland are moving heaven and earth to show Safeco games, but they kind of show Celtic playing in a new camp. Josh, what, what was your take on that? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit strange because, uh, like, I think the thing that kind of just underlines it is the fact that Sky Sports uh, put the Celtic game ahead of the Chelsea game, which is yeah the second biggest English game to the Man United one. Uh, so Sky Sports, they thought that the Celtic game was the biggest, uh, well, was bigger than the Chelsea game. And I'd probably go as far as saying that it was a bigger game than the Man United one. Mm. No, exactly. But moving on for that, and I'll throw this out to all of you, uh, and I'll, I'll go in an order of Stephen Patton and Josh. I mean, it's clear that Celtic teams progressed incredibly under Neil Lennon. Um, I mean, what, what can you can you name a few things that you would probably you could put that down to? Since if you go back to the you know the horrific Ross County game at Hamden, we were well beat that day, deservedly beat. Um, from then to then, go toe to toe with Barcelona New Camp and almost get a point there. But what, Stephen, what would you say that the key points of that's been? Why have we done that? Why have we been able to do that? 
Um, I, I think um, Neil Lennon, who, to be honest, after the Ross County game, I was ready to send him wherever he wanted to go for. I wasn't impressed mm. at all with it, but um, to be honest, but I, I think the the handling of the the, the Samaras um, Samaras's career, I think uh, when he brought up Fraser Foster, who everybody I, I know I know Foster had been exceptional for uh, when he was on loan with Paul Lambert at Norwich when he was still yeah. under Newcastle's books. And also when I mean he's bringing guys up like Kelvin Molson, I mean I, I I'd like to um I I mean something I thought of the other night, it's gonna off copy it a little bit. I'd actually say that this squad and I mean the word squad, not individual players, is stronger than a Martin O'Neill team. You know what? I'd probably agree with you on that. I was kinda of saying that earlier that we're not relying on any individual anymore. You know, we're slotting in players, we've got basically two players for every position now. Fans only clambering for um, new signings or we need to do this, we need to do that. Um, we, we needed a centre half, we've talked about needing a centre half, we've plugged that gap, we seem to have unearthed another superstar and you've got to give the credit to John Park for that. Um, my wee thing to throw in before I pass it over to Pat would be I think the work of John Park has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, I mean, this is a guy, uh, I was speaking to a guy on um, Wednesday who's kind of got a, a, it's pretty close to John Park and he was just kind of going through the kind of work that John Park does for Celtic. I mean, the guy, he knows every game going on everywhere. He knows every player. He's watching hundreds of games on TV and DVDs a week. He's going to games every single night of the week. He's got um, huge databases of players, or strengths, or weaknesses, you know, the whole nine yards. And, you know, so he's basically combing the world, looking for these players and then when positions come up that we need to strengthen, there's the list going straight to Neil Lennon and Peter Lawwell and saying, take your pick out of them. They're, we can afford them. They're the right age. They're exactly what you need and we can probably get them. But Pat, what are you going to add to that? No, actually, when you asked the question, my instinct, you probably just stole my thunder. But oh. I reckon it's... it's Sorry. John Park is certainly a part of it. I think it's... A big part for me, I think, is the whole, um, I guess, shift in terms of the way the, the club were approaching things. Neil Lennon's, I guess, just a, a bit of a cog in it. But you, you think of, I know a lot of people don't like Peter Lowell, but again, it's from top all the way down. They've cho they've changed all their structure. They've changed the way they're going to approach. They're going to go and sign the big players. They're going to try and, and basically um, scout players. So I think the the whole approach, um, sort of from top down, is is kind of turned things around a little bit, and it's it's worked in our favour. You know, yeah. the fact that, you know, like it's just the guys. Like not everything's worked out. Um, obviously, you know, some guys have come in and. Um, I know uh, Stephen's got a couple of a couple of favourites, the bold old sheriff, but you know things like that. Guys oh, come in. Oh, don't tease me about the sheriff. <laughs> 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 was going so well. Everything was going so well. <laughs> but you know, like guys have come in and they've slotted in. You know, like Izagiri. I mean, who would have thought? You know, the guys from Central America would be, you know, playing left back for us. You know, it's things like that. You know, like um, it, that's a, a big factor for us. Everything's, I guess, everything's kind of fallen away to a certain extent. Even we we Sevco going down. It gives us a chance to, to get in, gets the young guys through, gets a chance to blood them as well. And, you know, I think a few things have kind of worked out in our favour, I reckon. But I just reckon that. I reckon it's just a whole sort of team approach. The, Lennon came in probably just at the right time and, you know, he's, he got the right coaching staff. I mean, sadly, Tomo kind of left for whatever reason. And But, you know, you did all these, just a few things kind of fell into place. They picked the right players. Because um, John Park was actually one of the things I was going to bring up. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, sort of thinking what sort of questions they asked you guys, and that was one of the the big questions I had. You know, I don't know if you saw it at the start of the week about John Park, um, sort of interesting. I think it was Spurs. I can't remember Spurs and yeah. someone else like Swansea or something. You know, and if I just reckon it's probably as important as a big signing um, yeah, for I us. Mean, there's absolutely no doubt people are interested in John Park. About six, eight, maybe ten months ago, he was actually offered a job for life at Easter Road. Uh, you in the current climate, you didn't get a job for life anywhere these days. But, they, you know, um, he was a friend of Rod Peachy, and Rod Peachy basically asked him to name his price and he could stay for life, and he knocked it back because he's got something gone. I know for a fact that other clubs, particularly Newcastle, were looking at our structure and wondering how we were doing it a couple of years ago and the things that we were doing with the money and stuff when we were starting to bring these guys in, the Kyles and that. And that's the way they're now doing it. We've, you know, obviously in a higher level in terms of the money they can spend. But with Dan Baba and CC and that, they're going, they're scouting these players, you know, everything about them long before they come, etc. But Josh, have you got anything to add to that? Um, I think it's just uh, all the kind of cogs have just aligned together perfectly. Um, starting off, 
I think we got some really good players from the championship. Uh, we got uh, for cheap as well. We got Adam mm. Matthews, Chris Commons, Joe Ledley, Gary Hooper, and they know what it kind of means to play uh, British football. Mm-hmm. And they came in and they did a very good job. And then you've got the form players as well. Um, typically, when Celtic went for a form player, it kind of be a player that the fans have sort of heard of, or the or they've kind of got a little bit of a wisp about, uh, like Victor Wanyama, like mm. who'd really go, oh we want to sign this guy that's rated about £1 million in the Belgian yeah. league, that hasn't played a national team game uh, yeah Ambrose worth only about half a million playing in the Israeli league uh, f- five, six years ago under Gordon Strachan, do you think Celtic would have went for him? I, I don't think so mm. Um and just the ability to get you know so many of these players for cheap, and they're linking together well, uh, thanks to the coaching staff and Neil Lennon, and yeah, everything's just really going uh, clicking together. Yeah, I think it's, I think that's a good point. I also think that um, you know it was a big risk, you know, because if we'd done it and we hadn't got any real success with it, everybody would be saying, "Oh, why are we seeing all these duds for? No wonder we can't." Even win anything, we're signing too cheap, we need to spend money, we need to do this, we need to do that. So it was a big gamble, but um, I think the two massive things that will help it for the future was the, the selling of Eden McGeady, which funded the first part of it, and the qualification for the Champions League, which is going to fund the second part of it. But um, just just, just a sort of added thought to the Barcelona game, guys, and yeah, I'll start in reverse order this time with Josh, Pat and Stephen. Has, has the Barcelona game on Tuesday changed the way you're thinking about our progression in Europe this season? Do you think we can actually do more than you probably previously thought, Josh? Hmm. It's a tough one. Um, I mean, we did go to the new camp and we gave them a game and we got very close to getting a draw. But at the end of the day, we didn't, we didn't manage to get any of the points. And once you get into the later, into the later stages... It's only the really, it's only the result that really matters. Um, I think we have got a really good uh, chance of getting the second spot now, um, and then maybe there's a chance that we could get into the last state. And once uh, once you get into the last state, you know that's you really putting yourself on the European stage because you're mm-hmm. you're basically viewed as one of the best eight teams in European football internationally. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and if we don't get second place, I think this team could do very well in the Europa League. Uh, as we've seen in the group stage last season, uh, I think we could have got better results against Udinese. We should have beat them at Celtic Park. We got a draw away. This is a team that finished third in Serie A, I think. Uh, we did well against Atletico Madrid. Uh, we should have got two wins against Rennes. So. Europe League, I think we can go far in that. Uh, maybe even the semi-final, maybe in the final if we get third position. And we can probably get past the last 16 now uh, if we have a good performance on the day. Okay, so you're predicting world domination, okay? <laughs> Pat? Um, I don't... Yeah, it's, I think it's, a quite, it's a good question. It's a fairly tough one because I think way back at the start, probably the first time I ever called in to... Actually, probably this show, the first one we did, and it was. I think mm. I, I said then that I'd be happy, probably reaching the you kind of Europa League, just you know finishing yeah. that third spot. I, I think, uh, in lots of ways, I think it's probably the same as what Celtic have budgeted for. They've, they've probably, you know, they've, they've got this extra sort of revenue from Champions League. Everything from that is like a bonus, and that's kind of, I guess, kind of the way I'm looking at it. It's fantastic we've got to this point, and it's fantastic we're on a world stage. And if it would be absolutely marvellous if we could just get just that extra sort of half step, if we can just do something where people turn around and just go, yeah, he's a Celtic supporter. Because, I mean, you guys obviously, you know, being back home, everybody mm. knows who you are. But see, when you're in this country, and this, <laughs> actually, I just want, this is a sort of semi public forum. I want to apologise to my wife and my kids and my, all my <laughs> neighbours for the reaction on, on the sort of Wednesday morning because, uh, like, my, I've got a five year old kid and a two year old, and I don't think I've ever sworn in front of them, but. I just let out the loudest fark I've got to say I have ever. If anyone's walking past my house, they'd have been going, what the hell? But if that that's, I guess, how much it means to us. I just, my wife and I were chatting, I come home from work and she was sort of laughing. She goes, so, you know, what, what were you thinking? And I said, do you know what it was? 
this was a chance for me to walk into work and everybody knows I'm a Celtic fan and, and everyone go, that was brilliant. That was, you guys were absolutely, that is well deserved. You know, everybody recognises what you are. Now we're just another team at lost against Barcelona. You know what I mean? Mm. That's why we've got another chance of doing it. But so don't think the, um, you know, it's just an impact in, in Scotland. Like when you've got the whole world watching, um, it makes a huge difference. And I would just, I'd be so proud, you know, to be sort of walking around with the hoops on and people going, there's he supports Celtic, they beat Barcelona. You know, they beat the best team in the world. And but as I said, mm. now we're just another team that, you know, got beat. Yeah. Um, in terms of expectations, yeah, I mean, if I would absolutely love if we got second spot, but <laughs> Celtic don't do things easy way. We don't. <laughs> if we just don't do things easy way, so I think I'd be uh, content with a, a Europa League spot. But uh, I think a big sort of factor in that will be what um, Benfica and Spartak do, and yeah. Lisbon as well. You know, depending on the result of that one, you know, it could set us up for it. You know, it could make a two sort of juicy games coming up as well. But I still haven't worked out the the best sort of permutations of what do we want, what do we don't, what we don't want. So, um, so yeah, like uh, Europa League perfectly, uh, ideally. Uh, sorry, Champions League ideally. Europa League, I'd sort of be content with that. But look, it's been a roller coaster already. I've loved it. It's been brilliant. Stephen, uh, are we still cash and carry, or are we drinking mellow birds on the way to Harrods? Uh, no, we're, we're definitely we're, we're up to the Tim Hortons. I think Paul. I mean, for me, <laughs> the most the, the most important thing is is the fact that. I find that I'd have, and I'll probably get walloped for this, but I'd have taken the three points in Moscow and put the beat defeat in Barcelona. Um, to be honest, I mean, it works out better for us, but I think it's got to be looked into it. If that was a two-leg game against Barcelona to get through in the old still mm. European Cup, as Jason says, we've got a good chance. I mean, is, it, is that French journalist said on Tuesday night, Paul? That, that's not, and it's not taking it away because... The, the Barcelona midfield and whatever is exceptional. They bring on David Villa with no long to go, but yeah. they they are doing both Celtic part, mate. They're not going to. I mean, Mister Messi's performance rolling about and all that. He'll never and I, and I say I'll probably get shot off for this. He'll never lace Maradona's boots to me. That guy, he just won't. But um, I think hopefully, as Pat says, it's down to our results. But I'd like to think it's a magical night. It's a night after we we turn 126. We start. If we could beat them at Celtic Park, and hopefully if uh, Jason and Liam can have a sort of, we'll get a point at least in Lisbon and see what happens. I no, to, I, I completely concur with that. What you said about Messi, I mean, um, the reason Maradona was a genius is because he was always able to do it in complete adversity. If you look back to the 1986 World Cup when he scored the handball against England, the England team basically spent the next ten minutes kicking the shit out of him. And what did he do? He then just turned around and beat the whole team and scored. And that's the way to defeat that. I was actually kind of surprised. I've never seen that for Messi before on Tuesday where he, he, he was. He was bitching at the referee. A referee who, by the way, wouldn't, wouldn't penalise him in any shape or form at Hudson. He said, seemed a wee bit untouchable to me. But it was good to see that, you know. And um, it's like what Josh says, you know, it is about results. But if it is in a knockout stage, a 2-1 defeat in the new Camp is not a worse result. Um, so in terms of that, I mean, also, I mean, I don't know if any of you guys saw the Spartak Benfica game before the game. I thought Spartak Moscow looked absolutely exceptional. I mean, they literally tore Benfica to pieces on um, Red Tuesday, uh, and yet we went over there and had a good control performance and managed to beat them. So you know that that was something that really made me think that you know what we actually might be a lot better than we think. But um, I, I mean, I think it is a, effectively. Um, we're now looking at a, game, a situation where we've got three games left, two of them are at home we would all expect to beat Spartak I'd assume, Benfica's going to be the one, I think Benfica in Lisbon is going to be the difference between us um, qualifying for second place or qualifying to Europa because um, I, I don't think that um, um, I, I honestly don't think that Spartak are capable of taking points over us or Barcelona despite the fact of how good they look because of the way we play against them. Um, and particularly they played them in the last game. But um, the progression, I think, has been fantastic, you know, and there's been loads of great components, as we've all said. And, and if we're done with the, the Barcelona talk, we've had 40 minutes of it there. Um, it's a nice wee segue um, that um, I know that Josh was not really aware of this. I'm sure Stephen would be because there's not a thing in Scotland he's not aware of. Uh, Pat, uh, last week, Mark Watt, who's the kind of SFA I don't know what his title is, you know. I don't, I don't know what the guy does, to be quite honest, development officer or something like that, came out and said that the reason why the Scottish football team was so rubbish and then 
uh, to broaden it out, Scottish football was so rubbish because all our young players uh, drink Buckfast and eat burgers, which is a kind of common thing. I'm sure Stephen and Josh will be aware in Scotland of how you know that kind of thing's always levelled at um, the Scottish society, never mind just young Scottish football players. But George McCluskey, actually, who's an under-16 coach at Celtic, uh, came out with a, a really stinging retort in Mark Watt's um, criticism. And what he actually said was that uh, his under-16 team just now are all schooled at the same school. Every single one of them. They all go to the same school now. So a typical day, Monday to Friday to the rain, would be to be picked up at 6.30 in the morning, taken for training, then they would go and get their breakfast, then they would go to their school, do their lessons, lunchtime they'd be taken to Lennox Town, they get their lunch there, they go back to school, they come back to Lennox Town, they get a, a meal, and then they go training at night. And the consequence of that, which this started four years ago, is that in the under-16 Scotland games recently in the Victory Shield, Celtic had 13 players in that squad, and they had eight players in the starting lineup. So is it just because we're Celtic that we're not getting the credit for that? Uh, I'll go to Pat first. Well, first, I think he's being a, a bit harsh. I, I didn't read that comment, but that, I think he's been a bit harsh. Um, I think he's, uh, if this is a guy that's meant to be out there promoting these sort of things, he's mm. not doing exactly a great job on it. But yeah, like, I mean, I guess it, it comes out the kids' attitude. I mean, Celtic are doing things the right way. We've got a bit of money behind us. You know, we can send kids to, to school. I think St. Dinian's brings a bit, was that? Is that the one I'm thinking yes, of? That's the school right, in Glasgow? That's right. Yes. Yeah, so, so they've got to St. Dinian's, then, yeah, they're obviously doing their training. I didn't realise they did training before. I, I, I knew they did it sort of after after school and stuff. But yeah, fifteen um, hour days have been part. Well, see, I, I don't know. I think I, I asked Stephen this a while back. One of the guys in the previous podcast mentioned the um, was it uh, football's next biggest star? The, the thing in on Irish TV. Yes. Now I managed to find a couple of downloads for that. I won't sort of you know see, see how I did it, but I managed to, to watch the first three of them. And actually, um, I, I found it actually really interesting. I actually was, was pretty inspiring, really, watching what these kids had to go through, even just to get a trial. And the third one was basically them turning up at, at Parkhead, you know, okay, they, they get put into the, the sort of the fancy house and all that sort of stuff. But the, the whole training regime, and I mean, I haven't seen the sort of the fourth, and I think there's another one probably tonight, I think, on RTE. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of dedication, a lot of things you have to give up in your youth to do that. And, and I guess some just slip off. Off the perch a little bit. They just, you know, they, they get. I mean, I, I played football with some really, really great players, but they just they um they discovered women and drink, you know, mm. and some are going to do that. But you know, if you've got a sort of a national team with 12, 13 guys from one club, then you know, because we're not doing the wrong thing, but maybe other clubs are. And I should actually point out that one of the things that interests me is my uh, my nephew is actually signed professional terms with Aberdeen, so he's he's training sort of with reserves and stuff like that on the. He's only what 17 years old you know six foot four right enough but mm -hmm. so it kind of interests me these things watching what he's okay it's not it's not celtic sort of level but he's going to have to go through all this sort of thing and learn how the right diet and all that sort of stuff and so yeah. it kind of interests me watching and, and listening to these things and this sort of conversation so um i actually wanted him to see this program so i could ask him if that's what it's like at aberdeen because mm -hmm. apparently they have a good setup so um yeah, but yeah i think it, i think it's yep sorry Sorry, I'm saying now they've produced a few good young players and sold them on um, quite successfully in the last couple of years, Aberdeen. Yeah, I know that's and I, I, like I'm really proud of him. I'm, I'm you know, I'm his, his uncle. And I live this far away. I mean, I'd, I'd love to sort of you know go up to the pub one day and watch Aberdeen playing Celtic on the telly. You know, I, I, there's no doubt who I'd be supporting, but I'd be hoping for a you know a fluky <laughs> sort of one 0 win for us as long as he doesn't make any mistakes. But oh, you know, I just, I just, I, I'd love him to get to that stage, and it's kind of interesting. I mean, I'd, I'd give him a. I'd have given anything to, to sort of be where he is. You know, he's represented you know, Scotland schools and that sort of thing. And it's just, I couldn't imagine what it's like being like that, you know. It's just, in, and being that sort of stage. And I think he just takes it all for granted. But maybe mm -hmm. that's why guys do slip off the perch. They just take it for granted and assume that this is the way it's always going to be. Because if you've yeah, got guys I mean, that... Sorry. I was just going to say, I've actually been in that position you were talking about there with uh, watching them on the telly um, in New York, actually, one of the... The more I will not mention any names, but the one of the the more um, popular, not popular, uh, recognisable names, certain names in New York. Um, his nephew was playing for St Mirren against Celtic uh, in one of his first ever games, and of course in the pub he was delighted about you know, oh, my, 
See my, 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 my brother's delighted with this and this and that and next thing and all that kind of thing. And uh, he was just so proud of me. And as he walked out for some moments at Celtic Park, he was just so, he was almost in tears and all that. It was a really emotional moment. And then the boy scored against Celtic and he went absolutely berserk. And he was kind of like, what the fuck is he doing? You know? <laughs> but uh, these are the things. But I mean, Stephen, I mean, I know you're not a man that uh, likes to criticise the SFA, but what's your take on this? Um, I, I find it. I- I mean, uh, in a week where we find Mr Levine and uh, all the gang still in employment, Paul, I find that unbelievable that when Watt was employed by the SFA, you're better having somebody from the country. You won't find Dutch or Ajax employing MD4. And you've got a man with a technical know-how of Wally McStay unemployed at the moment. So, I, I mean, a guy like McStay, or even you could play devil's advocate where pals and Govan who passed away there. There's a guy in the, like Kenny McDill who could do a, a similar sort of job. These guys are in the position that they know how the Scottish game works and operates. You know, it's very, very easily for this guy to come in. He knew the remit he was going to come into. And as you say, it's when they're talking down the game, his job is to talk it up. So words like that, he should be, you wouldn't see that. I mean, England's just opened that £100 million academy down at the St George's. You wouldn't, yes. you wouldn't, dare, you wouldn't dare see Oh, an English guy coming out saying, oh yeah, 80% of our team like rap music and eat Nando's all day, that's how England's rubbish should be at the door, mate, you know? I think that's a good point you make. I mean, do you think in this country, uh, Stephen, particularly, that the we kind of get a wee bit romantic about it any time we hear a foreign name talk about our football and we think that he must have all the answers? Well, to, to take it in context, I think it's, it's very funny in the fact that... Um, after the, the Scotland performance in Belgium, that they were saying, oh yeah, we've got to copy the Belgian model. Any team that beats Scotland now, there's got <laughs> to be a five-year project. Do you know what I mean? I mean, Belgian football have got a fantastic renaissance of team at the moment, but before then, the only really Belgian players the last 20 years I knew was like the great Enzo Schiffel, all bread boots, <laughs> and you had that fanny boy to knock back Celtic, he signed for Sheffield Wednesday. You know, <laughs> they, they, they haven't been... I, I think that it's part of that same. I mean, the, the talent's always there. I think for me, the, the the biggest, the most heartbreaking thing in the last 18 months for football, whereas I'm not really a political animal, but I watched Scottish Question Time and watched like, a Labour councillor, a boy from Easter House, they felt that the scheme in East End of Glasgow, if, if the, the lads from Aussie are listening in, and they basically said that there was a young lad saying that a council 4D pitch they lads have got to find thirty three pound an hour mm. to play on it. So if you're if you're in the remit where maybe your, your kids aren't there's kids that are late developers in the football field as we all know. So if you're not going to get the chance to develop if you're not in one of these Dutch guys things that Hamden mean Hamden that that area they should have flattened Hamden Stadium, played mm. the national games at Murrayfield and made another one of those Tory Glen things with the indoor pitches and let the, pit, the kids play free and express themselves. And that's how you'll find players like we have been in this country for the last hundred years. Yeah, I mean, just before I, I go to Josh for his opinion, I've got a similar situation close to me. My son plays for Spartans, and they got a two million and then I think another million uh, grant to the lottery. Um, and there's kind of an ongoing issue with lottery funding um, in Edinburgh at the minute, which is the fact that in the last three years, which doesn't include Spartans money this because it was before then, uh, Edinburgh was given um, £7 million in lottery funding and not a single penny went to any kind of youth project whatsoever. And uh, it's kind of really disappointing in that. But you have a facility at Spartans which has got a stand and it's got pitches and all that kind of thing, but what it doesn't have is is an indoor environment for the kids. And I've seen my son, especially in recent weeks, you know, and his team, an under-11 team, standing shivering as they're being trained and all this kind of thing, and you didn't, they're not allowed to use a dressing room, they're not allowed to use a toilet, they're not allowed to use anything. And I can see in the eyes of some of them that it's, it's actually ruining their enjoyment of the game. And as you say, Stephen, we've got the facility at Tory Glen, but we've also got the well, Hamden, which, you know, we must be the only country in the world to spend $60 million on football and build a stand at Hamden for fat cats. You know, it's absolutely incredible. Anyway, that's my rant, but... Josh, uh, you, you mentioned though fear that your uncle's a coach at Celtic. Yeah, um, he's with the under 15s, and uh, I know for a fact that he's not the type of guy that would accept a football player going out eating bur- burgers and drinking Buckfast and 
you know, stuff like that, basically just throwing their football career away. Um, he's quite concerned with fitness and players being, you know, in the mindset of the game. Um, and on that kind of subject, you know, how Scotland's youth are doing, uh, the under 21s uh, finished second in their UEFA under 21 group uh, behind mm-hmm. the Netherlands and would have got promoted if they hadn't lost the last game because only I think four of the ten runner-ups uh, actually get to go through to the the final championship uh, mm-hmm. because there's only eight teams there so Celtic uh, no Celtic, Scotland were so close to getting to the 2013 Euro- European under 21 championships mm-hmm. um, they only lost one game and that was the last game against Austria away uh, they won three and drew four and you know uh, they've got a few good players Johnny Russell, Tony Watt uh, Gary Mackay, Stephen uh, Lee Griffiths and there's a couple of others in there mm. I mean this is a thing I'm, I'm probably, this is mere for Pat and Stephen given their age, old like me which is that we, we've always seen to do well up to about under 21 level and then we seem to hit a wall you know, we seem to, and I, and I think a lot of that is due to the fact that we get so much physical fitness work in Scotland at, for young kids. Um, that what, kind of what happens is these kids go over to tournaments all over the world. They go over, they do really well, they win them because they're much more physically strong. And then they, they come up against these guys when they've developed and not, they find that not only are they physically strong, but they can actually play football as well. I mean, the, the guys that, that Josh mentioned seem to be due to exceptional breed, you know, Griffiths, Gary McKay, Stephen Russell, Tony Watt. And we're perhaps now making a breakthrough, guys. Um, I mean, from our point of view, I think I think certainly even I, I think the best example of this is how English football is now, because yeah, obviously we, we are looking over now. We are finally recovering for the soonest years in Scotland, where teams like Hearts and even Kilmarnock were signing foreign has beens and, and and stopping the youth. I mean, for, for an example, I mean. For me, Celtic now is a prime example of, if you're playing abroad, you can look at guys like Van Yama, for example, and say, well, I can go there, I can get Champions League football, and I can get a move to England instead of maybe going to Wigan or whatever it's going to be, and you're just going to be, the player, the, the manager won't be in a position to trust you to start in the first 11 because he's fearful of his job. When you look at Owen Coyle, I mean, we were looking for Owen Coyle to get the Celtic job before Lennon, and where is he now? I mean, he's really yeah. two teams, hasn't he? Yeah, you know that, that is a good point. Like it's, uh, we we can be a bit fickle um, with kind of things like that, the, the golden boys and all that kind of thing can um, hang me. But I think it's an interesting point you make about the English uh, the English game. I mean, the English game, you know, especially at a national level, uh, to use to use my French, is dying on its ass. Um, I mean, they're, they're so lacking in technical ability now; it's unbelievable. Um, and as you say, Stephen, you know, perhaps um, in the past where they've employed foreign coaches to to coach these English players and stuff like that. I mean, I, I read an, a, an article by Henry Winter, and what he his take on it was the fact that the guys that are the top guys in the English team, like Rooney and Gerrard and people like that, they're just no used to you know, being the main men and clapped for everything. I and mean, they didn't like being booed, and it's hurts them too much, and they just didn't they end up going into a shell, which kind of maybe explains why they're no regarded as Messi or Ronaldo or people like that or any Esther or Xavi because they just didn't have that kind of mentality. Um, but in terms of the national team as well, uh, I mean, Pat, I mean, you've had a thing in Australia where the Australian national teams have kind of been up and down. I mean, how, how, how are Australia trying to progress their young players on these days? Well, it's actually, it's, it's actually a really good topic again cause, and quite topical here because... Um, so my my son's older son's five years old, so we're kind of getting friendly with people that he's, you know, the, the parents of the kids he's going to go to school with. Mm. And we had a sort of barbecue thing a week or two ago. It was like a sun, nice bright sunny sunny after, uh, Sunday afternoon. So all the families kind of got together in a park and stuff. And I was chatting to one of the the parents there, and he's going, "Oh, his son plays for a team, and if anyone's in Melbourne, I think it was Bentley Greens. I can't remember exactly. Bentley's like a suburb, well, not far from me, but." Um, Bentley Greens, I think, is one of the sort of bigger clubs um, in this sort of area. Again, I don't know for that for a fact, so I might be talking through my arse here. But he was saying he, his son you know, to sign up for the, the season. It was some like 
uh, I can just say it was like 500 bucks. So it would be like two, just say 200, 200 quid, something like that. And I was going, geez, that's a lot of money, you know, like, you know, that's, that's, because I, you think of when, probably when we played football, you turn up, you give a couple of pounds for the referee and that was it. Mm. But he was sort of chatting away and I was going, so why was it so much? And he goes, he goes, I think it's absolute value for money. And I was going, so what, 500 bucks is value for money? He goes, but these guys get trained by professional trainers. They have guys. I'm not just talking a guy who stands at the park and, and shouts and makes him run up and down like we would have done when we were sort of training. It's actually mm. skills coaching, you know, in and out of cones and, you know, marking little, they do it, they do it the right way. You know, it's kind of difficult here because you're right, Australia's in a bit of a slump at the moment. But I'll tell you something, they're doing a lot of things the right way over here. And it, 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 who knows the next, you know, the next phase, it might be another generation away, but because Australia's went through that phase of, because um, it was all kind of ethnic based here. Um, even mm-hmm. when I sort of first arrived in Australia, but they've moved away from that now. That's now, um, you know, you still have like amateur clubs that are Italians and Croatian that sort of thing, but you don't. It's not quite the same. There's no sort of Croatian club. There's no Italian club anymore. Like playing the in the A League, but in terms of the, the sort of you said, I mean, I'd have, I'd have loved, absolutely loved that as a kid. If you actually had professional coaches in to come in and train you. Now mm-hmm. I don't know if it's changed in Scotland. I mean, obviously you're you're some place for Spartans out there probably a step above but i'm just this team is just like a like an amateur team like a like a you know like a district team and you know that's i don't know where they get funding from obviously the 500 bucks you know they've got under 11s under 12s under 16s all the way up to and they have reserve teams and i guess it's a lot of money to bring in but they do a lot of things right out in australia they they certainly they're not going to die yeah they're not going to fail without at least trying if you know what i mean um but again, yeah. I don't know if that's, that sort of thing happens in Scotland. I know in West of Scotland, when I was growing up, there was nothing like that. You turned up for training, it was in a hall. You played you mm. know, a game of three or four aside, and then you get sent home. Long time ago, admittedly. But, I mean, it, but, one of the problems over Scotland now is that schools um, can of hope to open at night to, to, to you know, give kids' facilities, indoor facilities and all that. And so, Kenny, at youth level, you're sort of running a, a, an atypical sort of summer league where it kind of runs through March to November rather than through... I mean, I think, you know, and I'm sure Stephen will have experienced this as well, where I think that one of the things that you get now more than anything in Scotland, you still get these guys who coach teams that are absolutely obsessed by winning. You know, that's all they care about. And I heard the story, Gordon Strachan's actually the honorary president of Spartans, does a lot of promotion work for them and stuff. And they asked him to come along and present all the prizes and the trophies at the prize given night at the end of the season. And Gordon Strachan says to the guy, you, to be fair, I don't even agree with this. I don't think it does any kids at 12 year old to have 10 trophies and think they're the best player in the world at that age. But what I will do for you is I'll come along and give every level a coaching session and the guy never phoned them back. And what Strachan said after that was that's just all about the guy bringing me doing, sitting at my feet, sitting at his table all night talking football and looking at a big man in front of his mates. And that attitude's still prevalent. And I should say actually we've just been joined by the legendary Jim Rennox. Jim, are you there? How you doing, Paul? So we're just, uh, I mean, I take it you've been listening to the show so far? I've caught uh, probably about the last half an hour, mate. All right, well, we're, we're, we're basically talking about um, a thing that was prevalent in here last week where Mark Watt of the SFA said that um, one of the reasons why we're not progressing on as a football nation, especially at the national level, is the fact that all our young kids, um, you know, eat, buck, uh, eat burgers and drink buckfast and all that kind of thing, and I would just wonder if you've got anything to add about um, what's happening in your way in terms of progression, progressing uh, kids on in football. I just caught part there. Well, I, I stay I stay in Queensland on the Sunshine Coast, and Pat say there's a lot of professional coaches and that. Up here, Pat is totally different. It's if the parents didn't do it, it wouldn't get done really. And I mean, it's it's about three hundred dollars for your for your son to play football for four or five months of the year. Yeah, like I'm not. I'm not saying every club's like that. I'm just going by. Yeah. I, I think Bentley Greens is one of the bigger teams in the area. But I was, mm-hmm. I was kind of semi impressed that this guy was saying, if you think about it, if these kids even just go to the gym, it would cost them, you know, twenty, thirty bucks to go to the gym for half an hour. Yeah. If they've got an actual coach that's coming in and, and showing them the basic skills, I think that's brilliant. I'm not saying I could, I'll be able to afford it when my kids get a bit older, but it's. Uh, I said at least the at least they're trying. I know there's a lot of criticism of. Uh, what they call soccer Victoria or football Victoria, whatever they call something like that, about you know asking for all this money, but maybe they're doing it the right way. I don't know. I mean, I guess we'll find out in three, four, five years' time when if Aussies, you know, they're, they're pushing through. But um, it's not exactly a lot 
kind of in the, the immediate future it's, there's no one no real stars kind of coming through that's i think that's maybe why they're, they're trying that extra bit harder to do it because i think we all know how serious the aussies take the sport and football or soccer as they call it is um you know a fairly it's kind of the a bit of it's one sport they haven't sort of mastered just yet you know that's why when you know getting to the world cup is so important to them because it's, it's important for the game here i think the same as in america you know when, when the u.s get to sort of world cups and stuff like that, it just puts it on the map a little bit mm -hmm. i mean australia is kind of obsessed with you know there's aussie rules there's rugby um i mean cricket probably you know soccer as we call it here is probably fourth on the list I was, going to, I was going to ask you, Pat and Jim, I mean, obviously, we're listening to what you guys have been saying there. I take it primary school education, it's not going to be like the, the fundamental Scottish way that the school Janney runs the primary team, then you guys wouldn't have that over there. Yeah, I don't even think they've got a football team in my boys' school. They've got a rugby league and an AFL team, but they've not got a, a football team as such. Yeah, I think the same. The school, my son's, he starts uh, next year, it's the same thing. Um, I mean, the, the kids I've I've been over. We've had sort of open days at school, and I like I would say half the boys there are playing soccer. Um, so it's like certainly a, a really really popular sport to play. But it is probably the same scenario. Is like you know, like Mel. It depends where you live. Melbourne's a really sort of widespread, like kind of really big sort of city, and it's um, it's hard getting people together. And you have to book people like two weeks in advance. It's, it's a pain in the hole. There's no sort of spontaneous let's have a game of football. You'd have to honestly book something. I reckon two weeks to get you know parents to get their kids to go along and do it. But um, but yeah, so all, a, AFL and, and sort of Victoria is it's just that's the the main sport. That's what everyone talks about. Probably cricket after that. Rugby leagues. I'd say, even say rugby league here is probably after after soccer because Melbourne Victory are like the biggest um, sort of soccer team in Australia. I don't really follow A League in Australia, but it's certainly in gaining in, in popularity and that, that's without it even being on sort of free air TV it's, it's only on cable yeah. I think they're foolish if they got it on free air TV it would, I think it would even be even more popular I mean can I ask it, and the, and the, sorry to interrupt the, the Australian communities though can I ask what, what the, the the interest in the Australian national sports are by the naturalised citizens like the, the like the Croatian community the Italian Greek and the Asian community, do they play all the Australian national sports or do they stick to soccer as we call it or use guys we call it? Uh, the rug, rug, rugby league up here is, I think you probably mostly call it a lot of the kind of Islander guys and a lot of Aboriginal people play the rugby league. And I think it's the same in Melbourne. The part of a lot of Aboriginals that play in Melbourne, the AFL as well. But um, as well, there's for, not. As for, yeah. Yeah, there's not as many Aborigines in Melbourne. Uh, as, I think it's further north and sort of the, the warmer climate, you could say. But, but yeah, like it's. I mean, Aussie rules is a great sport. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't sort of be annoyed or anything if my kids played it. It's a really genuine good sport. It's hard. It's tough. It's, you know, it certainly toughens kids up a hell of a lot. You should, you know, I tried it at one stage. I played, tried to play a game, and my God, these guys were taking your head off. These guys are like six foot two. They're brutes, absolutely brutes. I mean, and there's no no prisoners taken. I just went. No, I'm. I'm not playing this. This is. And <laughs> someone's going to break my neck here. Um, so soccer is kind of like it's. It's more of a. It's looked upon as a, a bit of a safer sport for kids to play. In, so maybe that's why it's popular at a younger age. But it is the highest participation sport in Australia. From I think it still is. That's what I keep getting, being told. So um, there's more kids playing soccer and all across the country than playing any other sport. So. I think they got lost to it as they got older, but they got lost to it, and then especially up here, they start playing rugby league. Their parents push them into play rugby league because this is just a rugby league hotbed in Queensland. This is the only sport in town, really, to be honest. Yeah, I think see, in Australia, it's a, it's a bit different again from Scotland. It, it's when you come here and live here, you kind of notice that the, they have so many options here. There's you, you could play any sport in Australia if you want to do. Along the road for me, there's like the, a huge. I'm I'm talking probably a couple of square miles worth of baseball courts, or baseball pitches. So, you know they, they could do anything. There's cricket pitches, there's Aussie rules, there's there's rugby league, um, rugby pitches. You know, a kilometre or so away from where I live, it's there's there's everything here. So so kids have got a lot more choice. They can do whatever they whatever they want. They can do swimming. They can do Olymp uh, uh, gymnastics, all these sort of things. You can do whatever you want here. So I guess it's kind of spread a bit a bit thinner. You don't want me going like I'd love my kids to play soccer football um but i wouldn't be disappointed if they played aussie rules you know it's just because yeah, it's really up to them they can choose which sport they like 
Excellent stuff. Well, getting back to the old Glasgow Celtic, and I'll call to Jim here first, and we can perhaps, you know, move through his thoughts with Barcelona to Saturday. Talking about the Kilmarnock game on Saturday, uh, you know, obviously a wee bit after the Lord Mayor's show on Tuesday. Uh, Jim, what was your thoughts on the Barca game, and what's your thoughts for the Kelly game? Thoughts of the Barca game, I was sick going to work up at quarter to five to watch the game and I was absolutely sick going to work then a few hours later against Barcelona, did I expect too much before it? Mm, well, you always, you always think Celtic are going to win, don't you, no matter who they're playing? And oh, I was absolutely, I've, I've got nothing else to add, I don't even want to talk about that game, Paul, to be honest with you. So what about your thoughts yes. for Kilmarnock on Saturday? Kilmarnock... I, th well, I think there'll be a few players rested anyway. I think we might see Niku up front. Hopefully, hopefully he can go off the off the mark. I, I think I, I think it'll be a quite a difficult game coming, especially after losing that last minute goal. But I think we should come through and end up hopefully pretty comfortably. To be honest with you, well, we've been joined by Caledonian Investigation, which I believe is Chris. Is he there, Chris? Hi, yeah, uh, I am Paul. How are you? So you sound about half cut there, mate. You alright? <laughs> um, just a tired boy. Not drunk all yet. Right. Working on it. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll bring we'll bring you straight in, Chris. What's your thoughts on Barca and what are your thoughts for Kelly? Um, Barca, just like everybody else, totally gutted, disappointed. But uh, you've got to take the positives out of it. And I think that we've set ourselves up previous to it so that I don't think any points out the Barcelona games were. We're counted at the start, and I think we'll just set ourselves up nicely to qualify, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, basically, the, the positive of it are, if Barcelona are the best team in the world, and we do get through to the last 16, who have we got to fear? You know, we know we can go away, and yeah. well, we're, we're, we're there or thereabouts with getting a draw. If you get through to the last 16, and you're going to be confident getting a draw against anybody, who are you going to be scared of at Celtic Park? You know? Exactly. Um, Exactly, and I think it was yourself. But I listened to it, and it was it was a couple of weeks ago in Beyond the Waves, you know, and I was full of the doubts and all the rest of it. But when I heard you talking, you, you just said everything I was really thinking in my head about why should we be scared of anybody? Do you know, when we get people at Celtic Park. We've done it before. We punch above our weight so many times in the big stage. Well, that's what football's all about, isn't it? Do you know, and it's full yeah. of upsets. Why can't we be the team that are full of upsets on a constant basis? And when you look at there some stats, I was looking at there earlier on. I was talking about yeah, Barcelona had seventy odd percent stats. When Chelsea mm -hmm. beat them last year, we they had less possession than what Celtic did in the camp. When Man U played them previously, Man U had less possession than what Celtic had the other mm -hmm. night. It's not all bad, you know. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think the only our only enemy in this tournament now will be complacency. You know, if we start believing we're the best, you know, that, that's that's the route to your downfall. You know, we've got to keep punching and punching and punching and keep putting the blows into these teams and we will get there. But, uh, Josh, uh, Kilmarnock, I know you're a big admirer of Kenny Shields. What's your thoughts? <laughs> um, I think it could be a little bit of a tough game. Um, after the Spartak Moscow game, we didn't really have much of a hangover at all. Uh, but coming up again... Uh, against Kamarak after the Barcelona game. Um, I'm not sure how Scott Brown and Samras are doing. Um, and quite a lot of players did about 10k as well. So I, I could see quite a change squad. I could, mm -hmm. uh, And that could maybe need a, a change in tactics. Could probably see Tony Watt and Miku starting up front perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I think Kamarak might fancy their chances of a draw. Uh, and hopefully, well, but hopefully Celtic are just uh, on their day and uh, manage to secure the three points. And we'll hear your thoughts extended on the Paradise preview, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, no, there's no Paradise preview this week because we did it. Graham Wilson. Oh, I thought Graham Wilson had let you down again. No. No, that was a great answer. Uh, <laughs> Stephen, Kilmarnock, uh, you, are you enamoured with Kenny Shields? Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't get my call to be honest, mate. Um, I'll, I'll be no. I, I think there's, there's enough in the tank. The squad's big enough, as I said earlier on. Get Pony what up front he's sell. He'll terrorise him. Uh, I'm going to try and get to that Celtic Graves thing tomorrow at twelve o'clock. Paul, I don't. Yeah, know we'll, be about that soon. we'll be talking right, about that. We'll be talking about that. 
Uh, sorry, I no, there's enough in the tank. Um, I'm hoping with it being five pound a ticket for the for kids tomorrow. I hope that I hope that I hope there's a decent turnout for the lads. I mean, they done well in Europe. They're, they're, they're doing a good clap. I mean, obviously, um, to go off to off subject, it's interesting that you've probably seen where the, the Charlie Green numbers have been found out where I'm telling Porky Pies his attendances. Oh no, you're kidding me on Charlie Green lying. <laughs> Um, did you see that one about the, the somebody leaked the police memo? Aye, I did. Uh. Aye, but sorry, we'll back to the subject. Yep, yeah, I'll go for um, four 0 Tony Watt hat trick tomorrow. Stop. And before we go to pass, I should say that the Kenny Shields thing was a story I heard at the start of the week where um, Kenny Shields, uh, I, he's as a few journalists have told me, he's the most intense manager they've ever encountered in their careers. He never has a joke, never has anything. And uh, I actually got to the point last week where no journalist turned up for his press, press conference. Um, <laughs> now, a part of that's because, you know, his, his attitude, but the other part is because the journalism, uh, the print media has been decimated, you know. And Celtic and Safeco had their press conferences at the same time, so nobody went. So Kenny phoned each and every one of them up individually and gave them a mouthful. So it'll be interesting to see his thoughts tomorrow. But Pat, what are you thinking for Kilmarnock? You don't think they didn't turn up because Kilmarnock's a bit of a toilet, possibly? Well, the, I've, I actually made comments like that a couple of weeks ago and was, was told it was a hotbed of the <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> see, you have to understand, Pat. See, the minute you talk why, you'll get people, you know. I mean, I, I, I done a blog a couple of weeks ago and I mentioned Darren Brown and his fan club went mental at me. So. <laughs> but, well, uh, aye, Kilmarnock. So, I, I can't talk anyone from Airdrie. It's just as bad. Oh, anyway, Jesus, um, right, Josh, cut him off. <laughs> 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 um, there was, I think for for the um, the Kelly game, the I was watching the uh, what do you call it, the Huddle Online stuff, and uh, Lenny was on that being interviewed, and he more or less said that it's going to be sort of wide scale changes in the team and that for it, because you bear in mind we have, we've got St Johnson on Tuesday, I think it is as well, so yes, we don't have right. exactly a large gap between that either. So uh, yeah, I reckon it'll be a, a massive amount of changes. Um, because there was one thing I was thinking as well. It's actually one thing I was going to raise um, tonight is about um, we've got sort of central defence, but what about guys like Rogney? I don't know if whether he's going to get brought in as well because he's he's just disappeared off the map. Yeah, you know, his, um, he must be for the fifth, you know, fifth fifth choice centre half. You know, did they bring guy someone like him back who's in, in a kind of crude way a bit more disposable than the other guys? Yeah, seem to be issues arising at the Spartak Moscow game. Uh, we were all now where he was dropped and then he tweeted that he was gutted and then he deleted his Twitter account um, or, or, or perhaps Neil Lennon deleted it for him I don't know but um, yeah. I believe but yeah. uh, Graham Wilson and I Celtic is going to do a, a blog on that very subject it is one but I, I mean he could play he could play but I, I expect changes as well but I'll hopefully know enough that will uh, disrupt the momentum falling on for the St Murn game which I think we'll probably all agree was an exceptional performance but as Stephen then um, touched on there and it's something to get a bit more serious for a minute uh, tomorrow at Dalby Cemetery at 12 o'clock uh, Celtic part time uh, Dalby Cemetery being on London Road just along for the Celtic Supports Association uh, there is a kind of tribute ceremony uh, for James Edward McGrory who of course is not only a Celtic legend but is actually as uh, Jim Blythe the Celtic Graves Association said uh, is a worldwide footballing legend the top scorer ever in British football was at Celtic over you know, man and boy basically player, manager, coach you name it and even a pools guy for a wee bit um, and he also scored 8 goals in one game which I think is just a mind boggling if you think about it they're doing a ceremony at his gravestone and it's going to be very well attended um, by a lot of the Lisbon Lions and, and people representing uh, players that perhaps have passed on, their wives and family and stuff like that. And, you know, another huge credit to the Celtics people who are doing an absolute phenomenal job. Um, I mean, the question I was going to ask you to this, and I hope everybody who's going uh, enjoys it, I'll certainly be going, Stephen's going and stuff like that, and I'll be got a huge crowd at that, um, is that has Jimmy McGrory been given the recognition that he deserves? Um, and I'll throw the suit to Josh first. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, he is the highest goal scorer in British football of all time. I'm quite sure. Um, there's quite a few. I did big... just say that. Eh? What was that? <laughs> I said I just, just I did just say that. Oh, <laughs> sorry. No, you still uh, sleep? It's too early. No. Sorry for your Australian guys uh, who are just kind of chilling for the weekend. Josh is actually still in his bed. I know, actually. I, I, I'm next to it. Get on with it. Come on. Um, yeah, he's 
he's a big record, record holder. He was at the club for a long time. Uh, there was a campaign last year to get uh, Willie Mealy more appreciation. Uh, and I think the same could probably be said for Jimmy McGrory. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chris? I just think it's that generation thing again, isn't it? You know, when we didn't know who they were, we never, you know, I, I listened to my dad talking about them years ago, and he go, yeah, okay, but my heroes were Kenny Dugleish and all the guys in the, the 70s, you know. It, it's one of these things that we all know who they are. Most of us can name the the 67 team from start to finish, but we didn't know who they were. They got the respect for from what they'd done, and, but we all move on. Celtic is, are, are very good at retaining their history, you know, promoting it, but it's new generations and we're, we're trying to attract the new ones and the, the heroes for the new kids are the current crop and I'm not saying we should forget about the old players and we shouldn't educate them in their history, but it's just one of these things that people don't get the recognition they probably should have got, but it's just a sign of the times. Mm-hmm. Jim? Uh, I'll, I'll follow up on that. It's, everything's accessible through YouTube. Unfortunately, you don't see Jimmy McGrory or some of the even you know, even a lot of Kenny Dalglish in a Celtic jersey, who was my hero as well. Growing up, uh, you don't see a lot of everything's just instant. What happened really at Sky and so on. You can pick up Henry Larson or whoever. You, it's, just, yep. it's, it's just one of the generation things. Pat. Yeah, I'm, I'm with Jim. I, th- I think a lot of it would be down to the fact that there's, you know, little or no sort of TV coverage of them and no, you know, nothing for kids to see and people to see. It's all right for people like us reading about it and stuff like that, but yeah, it's just a shame it was it was that sort of era where you don't, you know, there just there wasn't stuff like that. There wasn't sort of, you know, film reels and stuff like him playing. Yeah, mm-hmm. so yeah, I think it deserves a recognition. It's, you know, still a world record holder or a British record holder, whatever it is, so... Um, for us, yeah, it's good, but I guess no one apart from us probably really cares that much about it, sadly. Stephen, tell us why people should go to this event tomorrow at Dalby. Well, it's, we're very lucky, Paul. I mean, us, us guys of our generation, we were here when the club was 100 years old, and we're here when the club's 125 years old. I don't know if we'll be here for 150, so <laughs> that's the reason I'm going tomorrow. Um, the only <laughs> thing that lets Jimmy McGrory down is, is that his second name doesn't ring very well, like Whaley does for a song. You know, <laughs> me, 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 but we're looking at now, if a, if a man like Mr McGrory had been pl- playing maybe 20 years ago, I mean, how big a name would McGrory be if Twitter was going then, believe it or not? You know, I mean, a record like that for being a British record doesn't do the English football authorities very much having a, a guy playing in a, another country holding a British record. And it yep. didn't do well like the party pals in Zombieland or the 49ers, as I call them, do any favours. So, it conveniently, it's something I think we, we as a supporter base have got to keep going because nobody else is interested in Mr McGrory's records, but we should be. Yeah, I mean, I think it's right. I mean, it's. I think we should touch on the fact that we're talking, I, I agree, Jim and Chris, Pat, you know, it's a different generation and stuff now, but Jimmy McGrory was never appreciated in Scotland when he was playing. I mean, he, he only got seven caps for Scotland, which is just incredible if you think about it. And, um, you know, as the saying goes, if you know your history, and I think that perhaps that's why Celtic's such a unique club. You know, I, I read somebody on Twitter saying a couple of weeks ago about how, well, why are Celtic different to other clubs? What's the difference? The difference is the Celtic Graves, the Titans, the Keno Foundation. It's organisations like that. That is the difference between Celtic and the rest. And I would really like to see as many people turn out to this event tomorrow because, uh, and it's, it's it's great as well when we talk about the generational thing and perhaps technology not being available. We've got guys like Chris Kajawa who will be going to that thing tomorrow and he'll be recording it so that everybody in the world can hear it. And that's, that is fantastic. You know, you can bring out the whole Celtic family into that event. But it's something, you know, I really hope will be well attended and... Um, I really hope that um, you know these things are continuing on. We know the Celtic Graves have got an event on uh, November the sixth, the hundred twenty-fifth anniversary of the club, and it's going to be at St Mary's at half past five. And then there's going to be uh, it's a mass, but it's open to all creeds, colours, religions, faiths, wacky faith, you name it, because it's about Celtic. Celtic's an inclusive club and always has been. Um, so aye, so that's good. So um, before we've got a couple of announcements, but has anybody got anything else they want to throw in? Any announcements for the club themselves? Anybody want to take Stephen on a date? I, I, need one, 
Tumbleweeds. Like Tumbleweeds. So I, I, need, I need one actually, obviously, to do with, with your boot launch pornos. As I see you, and if, if anybody listening in has got any dire, dietary um, requirements, i.e., vegetarian, get hold of you and let me know. I know, I think you said there was five or six of them, Paul, because I'm yeah. getting to the stage now where I'm really cranking up something the menu at now, mate. So sure. uh, people need things, and that's it really, for me. Pat, you got any announcements for your club or anything else? Um, I've got one for our supporters club. Um, I guess I'm 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 not really in a committee or anything anymore. The the Jock Scene Supporters Club, but um, the club has been a big part of my life since I came here. I think I, what ninety eight arrived, and like probably most of my best mates are through the, the supporters club. So it's, it's been a big part of my life, and it, it's been getting a bit hard in recent times. Where you know there's no Sevco games to, to sort of meet up for, and just the crap sort of kick off times that we have out here. So. The, the guys are sort of ramping up more of the, a social aspect of the club as well. So if anyone's in the Melbourne area uh, next Friday, which is the 2nd, if I remember right. So next Friday night, basically a week yeah. from now, we're going to have a bit of a catch-up in the pub, which is the Pint and Punch in Windsor. Oh, that's um, uh, Sean Fitzgerald's place. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh, so, good uh, meeting of mine, Sean. Good meeting of mine. Yep. Yeah. Well, Sean was at my wedding, so we're all sort of, you know, he's one of my best mates here. I spoke to him all day. So. I hope it was in an open yeah. bar, was it? Yeah, uh, it was for a while. Oh, oh geez, just seen it. That's the your oh. fortune. <laughs> uh, luckily, it was a flat rate. It was actually was I was going around everybody about ten minutes before the bar shut. I was going right everybody quick. I want this place drank dry. <laughs> so it was, it was a a big night. Um, yeah, so we're just going to try and catch up, paint on punt, seven o'clock next Friday night. Um, I think they can get me through. I, I don't really use Twitter and promote it that much, but um, they've got yours. If you just pass on anyone getting any, any sure. questions on it, just um, let me know and stuff Absolutely. like that. Can I just make one? Big thanks as well. I, I've been meaning to do this last few times I called in, um, and it was just following on from what you said, Chris. That's what kind of reminded me when Chris going to the um, the good self to graves thing. Um, I just want to thank Alan Mack from a huddle board. Whoever you are, Alan, um, you're an absolute godsend for guys like us. See those little articles and YouTube things that he yeah. he posts for people. Oh, you've no idea how much <laughs> how much that means to people like me. Because uh, you wake up for. You know, when I say early in the morning, you go to work and you see these people talking about um, things that have been on the report in Scotland or you know, Newsnet, all these sort of things that we don't get to see. And then all of a sudden, these just pop up. So, Alan Mack, whoever you are, thank you very much, mate. Perfect. Well, if nobody's got anything else to add, I'll just say I've got a book coming out uh, on Wednesday, Halloween, but pre-order links are available today. You get in touch with me on Twitter at, at PaulLarkin74. I'll sort you out with that. We've obviously got the Bamport book launch coming up, which uh, our chef Stephen Monaghan will be catering. Um, we've got Beyond the Waves coming on tomorrow. Uh, I think that's going to be 7 o'clock Celtic part time, where Mr Wilson, the Rev, and the coach will be giving you their stateside perspective on hopefully a good win against uh, Kilmarnock. We've got the homeboys back, as usual, half past seven on Monday, where um, I'm sure many will join us in looking back at the Kilmarnock game as well and looking forward to St Johnston and things like that. Uh, Josh, you got anything you want to say before we go? Uh, just one thing can I add about Hail Hail Media in general. Um, mm -hmm. On the Hail Hail Media website, on each show page uh, for each podcast, there's now a playlist so you can watch... Uh, all the episodes for each show um, easily since August and also there's a Hail Hail Media shop, uh, st well, store uh, yes. that's Hail Hail Media dot uh, spreadshirt dot co UK that's the UK store and dot com for the USA store or you can just go on to Hail Hail Media dot com and as soon as you get on it there's a big image that links to the store uh, and you can get shirts, mugs, uh, iPhone covers and stuff like that. Any knickers? What was that? Um, I've, I've got a couple of questions. I, I don't know, are you, if you try to finish up, but these are more questions than anything. Right, okay, um, we've got, we've got I, seven minutes left, Pat, so on you go. Um, the, um, I was thinking when um, we didn't get the result the other night, but in the UEFA rankings, do you know how many points we'd have to get to move Scotland up in the rankings? Is anyone 66. any idea? Like sixty-six. So how how would that work? Would we have to get a certain number of wins, or do you get certain well, points we, for a win and stuff? Even even by winning it, we're not going to move up the rankings this season. Yeah, I was just thinking, sort of, you know, a couple of years down down the line, you know, like if if it was a case of you know if we beat you know Barcelona and beat you know another win another two games. So we've got a mile to go then to get into that next stage, isn't it? Yeah, we need to accumulate. Although it's it's kind of funny because 
we will have to go down the same route as we did last season. This season, I beg your pardon, you know, the two qualifiers and that. But then uh, we won all the qualifiers, so we get points, you know. And so, in a funny way, even though it's a hardship to go through these games, if you do get through these games, you will be rewarded, you know, sooner sooner than later kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and picking up these things. But, you know, qualification and European progression um, past Christmas will be a huge thing for Scotland and a huge thing for Celtic's coefficient, no doubt about that. I'm just thinking down the track if you end up getting a, a second club, at least in you know qualifying a third club and qualifying. So um, yeah, well, I guess it's like because what you're entering next season is uh, it's, everything's done on a five-year basis, and as Stephen uh, alluded to earlier on, our dearly departed friends, UEFA Cup running 2008 no longer counts in the coefficient. So we really need a, a really strong performance we see like this season, given the fact that no other club even kind of qualified for the tournaments. Anything else, Pat? Oh, I've got a thousand questions. Uh, I'm just, this is, through the panel, you can give me, I guess it's just one number, because I've got mates here that wind me up saying that I'm too old to wear a Celtic top. What's too old to wear a Celtic top? I'm 41. <laughs> is that too old? Come on, guys, you can be so, honest. Right, we'll go Chris first. <laughs> 30s is, is out. <laughs> Jim? Uh, I'm, I'm saying I'm 43, and my in-laws are coming out in a couple of weeks, and they're bringing me that new one with a... The Celtic cross on it, so I, I don't think you're too old, Pat. Not at all, mate. Stephen? Eh, uh, well, you are a close connoisseur now. 100, 100. Well, I've spent a bit of time in the Italian continent, Paul. I always feel advised. Somebody for Erdre, it's nice to see them wearing clothes. Um, <laughs> 100, ne never too old to wear the hoops, for God's sake. Come on, man, sort it out. Josh? Um, in public... I'd say 40. In private, around <laughs> your house, not as old as you want. Right, hold on, Pat. Just let me check that. Right, okay. Uh, it's average due to 40. It's average due to 43, so you've got two years left, okay? <laughs> no bother. <laughs> right. On that bombshell, guys, I just want to thank you all for calling in. It was a really uh, average show when Stephen was talking. I'm only kidding. No, it was a really good show, really informed, uh, a lot of great stuff. And thanks for listening. Uh, we will be back two weeks, same time, same place. Hopefully, same callers, new callers, new listeners, and so on and so forth. But on behalf of Hail Media, the homeboys on Anna, thank you very much, and hail, hail to all yous. Hail, hail. Hail, hail, lads. Okay. Hail, Paul. Cheers. Hail, hail. Cheers. <laughs>